Hello, I'm Catherine Abeka, and I will be discussing a first step in Tanyans and unification. My project advisor is Ms. Nakamura, and my committee members are Dr. Becerra and Dr. Jedek. So why Tanyans, or in fact, why unification or string theory for that matter? Um, it's not intuitive at all to imagine the role of an eight-dimensional structure in our four-dimensional universe. It, it does become more apparent when we think of it in the context of string theory. A physics model that predicts nine spatial dimensions. Physics places great emphasis on theories that unify physical phenomena, and that's been the theme since the 19th century. Um, James Burke Maxwell, for instance, unified electricity and magnetism into one theory. Um, Albert Einstein brought the separate concepts of space and time into one with the special theory of relativity, and so many more. So, yes, it is true that unification provides a more elegant theory, but more important than that is that it fixes the inconsistencies in separate theories. So it's no longer optional, but necessary. Um, the goal is to unify gravity, electromagnetism, the strong force, and the weak force into one theory of everything. Um, right now, the standard model is a quantum model, but it, it doesn't include gravity. So that's where string theory comes in. String theory is a quantum theory that includes gravity. Although it has been proved, it works so far. Um, we're just waiting on, with fingers crossed, that it will get proved soon. Um, a mathematical way to think of unification is like a master formula that works for all the forces. It works for everything. So that is the goal. Um, the historically, whenever um, a force was unified with another force, whenever like forces were combined, it was always a thing to work in an extra dimension. So this fact, along with the relationship of symmetric theories and division algebras, make it necessary to investigate the Italians as we perceive a unified theory. So how is it possible that we have six extra spatial dimensions we didn't know about? So we know that we can move left, right, back, forth, and up, down. Um, right now, the extra dimensions are suspected to be compact spaces curled up so tight that they are not observable to us. And theoretically, they've been shown to escape detection in low energy experiments, which is why all the experiments to prove that these extra dimensions exist that would prove string theory have, <clears throat> excuse me, have involved bombarding particles with high energies. So we're gonna like discuss this by thinking about one compact, one um, spatial dimension, first of all, just because it's more it's simpler to do. So imagine we live in a world with only one spatial dimension and as you walk along, you observe that the scenery repeats every time you walk a distance of t pi r for some r. And in fact, not only the scenery repeats, but the, the events that happen at the scene, so, such as like meeting your friend, Monkey D. Luffy. Um, so if you can see ahead, you will observe clones of Luffy repeating down the line at distances of t pi r, 4 pi r, 6 pi r, and so on. And if you look up the line, you can see the same thing as well. Now, the only way that we can describe the strange phenomenon is if we instead think of the line as a circle. So a circle with a circumference of t pi r. Um, in Luffy isn't, and so Luffy isn't actually repeating every distance of two pi r. Instead, you are just coming back to the same point on the circle. So we do this um, using an identification so that, let's say, this is the point x. If we add two pi r to it and end up here, that's the same point x. Um, so we call this interval from zero to two pi r our fundamental domain for the identification, and we can simply join these points the two endpoints together and we'll get our circle, our 
overcome that dimension. Now, this is the same story in more than one dimension. Um, we can choose to apply an identification to compactify only one dimension, or we can do it to two dimensions, as many as we want. And in our world, we're saying that we live in a world of six compact extra dimensions. Now, we go on to discuss the quaternions. The quaternions satisfy s squared equals j squared equals k squared equals negative 1 um, to four-dimensional algebra so that i times j is k, j times k is i, and so on. i times k is negative j, j times i is negative k, and so on. Um, here, we give a little multiplication table for it, and we use q1, q2, q3 instead of ij, k, just to respect that different notation does exist. Um, now we show the postulates for the set of induction of a tunions, I'm sorry. Um, we have the addition postulates. Um, those are actually just the same as the real number postulates. And the multiplication right here, slightly different. Um, we do have that the set is closed. We have that is alternative instead of associative. Um, that just means that it's associative for every subalgebra of any two elements. So we actually need three different parts to describe this relationship. Um, it has an identity and an inverse element, and it is anti-commutative. So x times y is minus y times x. Next, we show a simple lemma um, about the norm of x that we prove using the postulates from the previous slide. Um, x, we let x be an octonian and bar be its conjugate. Now we say that x times x bar is the same as x bar times x, and that is actually the norm of x, which is just a product or a sum of the products of the real parts. Um, this is only a snapshot of a part of the proof because it's actually quite a long proof. And you see that we start by showing x times x bar, but we do have to finish up by showing x bar times x gives you the same result. Now, we use the previous result, the norm, to show the form of the inverse of x. We are saying that the inverse of x is x conjugate divided by the norm. Now, we show this simply by um, well, I guess a bit of modern algebra. We remember that the inverse of x has to satisfy x times x inverse um, equals the identity equals x inverse times x. And then we just take a Even looks like the identity divided by x. So we go ahead and multiply it by the complex conjugate, sorry, the tenionic conjugate, just like with complex numbers, and we end up with the identity times x conjugate, which is just the conjugate um, using the postulate of multiplication, and x times x conjugate, which is just the norm from the previous. Now we show tenionic multiplication. Um, the first extension is the least intuitive extension, but it does directly um, describe. So Q1 is defined as E1, Q2 is defined as E2, and Q3 is defined as E3. So that this little multiplication table right here, um, the First three columns and sorry, one, two, three. First four columns and first four rows are actually the octonian, the quaternion multiplication table. Now, extension two and extension three use cyclic multiplication to define these tables. Um, cyclic multiplication month seven from one to seven. 
Now here we do a simple exploration of a tonian subalgebras um, substructures. It's very straightforward, um, but it doesn't end up being much use. If we go back, um, we can pick any three elements that are related in some way and create a substructure of them. And if those elements are simply the elements that are extended from the Ectonian, so for instance in extension 3, if we pick E1, E2, E4, those elements will associate. And so it will give us an algebra that associates, and that algebra will actually just be the Pastorian subalgebra. If we pick elements that don't associate, those elements will just give us back the Ectonian. So um, we found this route to be not very, what's the word, illuminating. So we went on to instead look into the um, We find this very nice theorem, E sub A, E sub B, equals E sub C. Um, if that's true, then E sub 2A, E sub 2B equals E sub 2C. Um, this theorem gave us these two propositions um, when we combined that theorem with um, extension 2 and with extension 3. So we're actually just going to look at one of them. We'll look at the first one because they're very, very similar. We get e sub a, e sub a plus 2 to the n equals e sub a minus 2cn plus 1. And so we prove this by mathematical induction since these we're performing induction in n. So these are simply just like recurrent recurrent relations, although Octonians are in an ordered algebra in ordered set, it's okay to do this because we're looking at this like recurrent relation. Um, so for the base case, we show here that we, we start with the um, definition of the second extension, and we use this theorem right here um, that doubles the subscripts and the basic units, but preserves the equation. So we get e sub a, e sub a plus 1 to become e sub 2a, e sub 2a plus 2 and e sub a plus 5 becomes e sub 2a plus 10. Now e sub 2a plus 10, using the idea that e sub a we get e sub a plus 3 because um, 2a becomes a because all elements of c7 are generators so we, if we multiply by 2, we're just going to get a back. And 10 becomes 3 mod 7. Um, that's going to be the same as e sub a minus 4. So we get the desired result, e sub a minus 2 to the power of 2. So here we show the associator for three tonians, um, it's going to be x, y times c minus x times y, z, which will give you two x, y, z, since the tonians aren't associative. Um, for two distinct tonians, the associator is zero, since the tonians are alternative. Um, we would actually get zero for the associator of algebras that are associative right here. Um, Finally, we just show um, a property that's a little bit similar to some properties we see with differential forms. Um, when we interchange x, y, z in the associator, when we interchange an even number of elements, we get the sign unchanged. When we interchange an odd number of elements, the sign changes.
here we just show the Maison laws, which um, attach more predictability to the tunnels, and we show some conjugation laws. Um, we show the biconjugation law, which is very similar to double negation laws, the product conjugation law, which stems from the anti-commutativity of actinians, and we show that the norm of xy is the norm of x times the norm of y. And finally, we show, we give a formula for the associated inner product. Now we define some terms that we're going to need um, to continue. We define an inertial reference frame, it's worth called the Lewand's frame, to be one for which the first law of class one accounts hold. Um, if you don't remember, that is just uh, the law that states that a body in which no external forces act either remains at rest or moves with constant speed along a straight line. In the context of relativity, it is one that drifts in gravity-free space without undergoing rotation or acceleration. The, an inertial observer is one that, that is at rest with respect to an inertial reference frame, and we're going to refer to those as the lens observers. The world line of an object is the path it traces in four-dimensional space-time. And the Minoski space-time is just a description of events in four-dimensional space. Um, and we're going to characterize these events by x sub mu. x sub mu consists of one time and three spatial coordinates. x zero is a time coordinate scaled by the speed of light so that it is a distance just like the other coordinates. So now we're going to describe something called an invariant interval. Um, suppose we have two different Lorentz frames, and we're representing the same two events in each frame. So each frame is going to have, let's say the first frame has coordinate x and the difference in x, and the second frame has coordinate y and the difference in y. So clearly these are two different coordinates and two different coordinate differences, but they're going to have the same invariant interval which we usually denote by delta s squared or ds squared, um, if we're talking about inf infinitesimally close events. Um, and here we just show the uh, formula for the invariant interval. Um, the negative sign and the dx sub zero squared just represents the fundamental difference between the time coordinate and the spatial coordinate. The negative sign on the, on the left-hand side the one on the ds squared. That just means that for time-like separator events, so where the time coordinate is greater than the sum of the spatial coordinates, we, we're going to see um, a positive invariant interval. And we can get a negative invariant interval, we can also get zero for invariant interval. Now, what is a Lorentz transformation? Um, a Lorentz transformation is simply a linear relation between coordinates in two different different inertial frames. So we have these two Lorentz frames, S and S prime, and we can describe the coordinates in S in terms of the coordinates in S prime. That's um, the basic idea of what a Lorentz transformation is. And they're usually represented by matrix, by matrices, sorry, um, matrices L. Resistors. So here we let eta be your mission two by two of dynamic matrix given by this. So to be a mission matrix, it has to be equal to its conjugate transpose. So we see here that the Etonians A, the Etonian A, and um, right here across from it, we have diagonally across, I guess. We have its conjugate. And then for PM, those are real numbers that P and M are real numbers, and they're A sub zero plus A sub nine, and A sub zero minus A sub nine. And that preserves the matrix under conjugate transpose. We have 
analyze the properties of weak tunions because of the relationship between the symmetries of neuron division algebras and supersymmetric theories. Although the tunions lack associative incommunicativity, we were able to find sufficient patterns in their behavior in the for instance. Um, and we did focus on Lorentz transformations here, but Maxwell's equation and the wave equations are good openings, um, good areas that we can extend to present tonalic representation. Um, these are the references that we use. Any questions now? Thank you very much. Bye-bye.